Thank you very much. Thank you, please. Thank you very much. Thanks. Please. Please. Cheers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Barbara, Dr. Young. Uh, you really did your research. Where'd you get all that stuff from? <laughs> you can see how she got her PhD. Um, Reverend Hicks, members of the clergy team, uh, mayors, chancellor, congressman, and as I learned to say in South Africa, all the feathers of the eagle. All the feathers of the eagle. That's all of you. That's all of you. That's all of you. And, uh, and you know where that, you know where that phrase, that phrase comes from? It comes from that great African proverb, that great African saying that it's each and every feather that makes the eagle soar. It's each and every feather that makes the eagle soar. If you take the American eagle, if you take the African eagle, if you take the British falcon, we don't do eagles, we do falcons. <laughs> but if, if you take those, those great birds, which soar as they do in the sky. What you know is when you look at those birds, that their wings and their bodies comprise of a multitude, a diversity, Chancellor, a diversity of feathers, different shapes, different sizes, different weights, different colors. And it's the way they come together. It's the way they work together that gives the eagle its lift, that gives the eagle its magnificence. And there's a lesson for us in that. And the reason why this church community, the reason why this church community that embraces uh, Jeffersonville, that embraces Louisville, uh, that embraces New Albany, <laughs> and the metro area is so successful, it's because each and every one of you plays the role that you do in making it a success. Sisters and brothers in Christ, we live today at this time, much as in Micah's day, at a time of economic upheaval, political volatility, and moral and cultural ambiguity. And as I join with you, therefore, today to reflect on the impact of globalization, and globalization takes many shapes and forms of meaning, defined in many different ways. John Sweeney, the president of the AFL-CIO, defined globalization as the process of creating a unified global economy through the breakdown of barriers between national economies. It is a process, he says, driven by the imperatives of the market and the actions of policymakers. That's what John, Freak, uh, that's what, uh, John Sweeney says. Uh, there's a different definition from Thomas Freeman, who talks of the, uh, some of you will know him from the New York Times, he talks of the inexorable integration of markets, nation stakes, and technologies to a degree never witnessed before in a way that is enabling individuals, corporations, and nation states to reach around the world farther faster, deeper, and cheaper than ever before. Cheaper for some, more costly for others. Cheaper for some, more costly for others. So there are many different shapes and forms and takes on globalization. But whatever your take on globalization, it has this common characteristic. It is calling into question old boundaries. It is calling into question 
established categories and traditional values. And as I share with you my experiences of a childhood in Africa, my late teens in Britain, a maturity, put it that way. <laughs> I'm 60 now, I consider myself mature. <laughs> Just about. <laughs> a maturity lived largely in Europe, but now in Africa too, where I spend about a third of my time. It is in viewing this time that I find in Micah, in Micah chapter 6, Micah chapter 6 verse 8, Micah chapter 6 verse 8, it is in Micah that I find a clarifying call to this global moment. The Lord God has told us what is right. The Lord God has told us what he demands. See that justice is done. See that justice is done. Let mercy be your first concern and humbly obey your God. And humbly obey your God. Or as the King James's version puts it, and we are celebrating the King James's version in this particular year. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. I like that, which is one of the reasons why I like the King James version. I like this notion of walking, of walking with God. And I've had, you know, I've had some experience of globalization these past three weeks. In fact, in a way, I'm sort of globalized out. Uh, I, I began the three weeks, literally almost three weeks ago, slightly less actually, in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, I was uh, in Phoenix uh, to meet as a member of the Global Board of Food for the Hungry, whose organizational base is in Phoenix, Arizona. We uh, got offices in Washington. We got offices all over the place. We're a global organization in every continent of the world except uh, uh, Antarctica. And we were there to wrestle with the implications of disaster relief, which has to continue in Haiti, which is uh, still sorely afflicted by the aftermath of that earthquake, by the floods in Pakistan, by the famine in the Horn of Africa, and the ongoing challenge of building sustainable livelihoods in the developing world. I then went on from Phoenix to Washington, D.C., to meet with some commercial clients of mine in a US law firm seeking to expand their work in emerging markets, and also to have a meeting uh, with uh, the Africa Intellectual Property Trust, where we are working, as Barbara says, on intellectual property value capture for a number of rural and indigenous peoples all over the world, but particularly in Africa at this time, and we're engaged in a specific project which is about linking Maasai women who produce this beautiful jewelry, this beautiful beadwork, who produce this beadwork out in the rural areas but don't actually get an opportunity either to sell it in the markets of Nairobi, let alone to gain the added value of a trademark and the ability to export it and to link up with jewelry makers and jewelers and retail outlets globally. Other people do that who aren't Maasai and who aren't women and who certainly aren't poor. And thanks to you all, thanks to you all and also, although not as much, but 
Thanks also to the British taxpayer, thanks to the US taxpayer and the British taxpayer. The US Intellectual Property Office, the US Department of State, the UK Intellectual Property Office and the Department of International Development in the UK are supporting a piece of work that's about linking up those indigenous producers to world markets. And that's an upside of globalization because as they link those women in this particular instance up to those markets, the women benefit, but so do we all benefit through enhanced trade and through the added value that comes with that. And we give people a hand up rather than a hand out. That has to be a better way. And then, from there, and you know, I was only there for 24 hours. I was only in Phoenix for, what, 72 hours. From there, uh, on uh, to, uh, to the hinterlands of Nairobi to spend time in support of my queen's youngest son, Prince Edward, who heads up a board of which I'm a member, the International Youth Award, and that was a, a gathering of young people from all over the world, including the United States of America and your neighbor Canada. It's okay to mention Canada, is it? Uh, I always have to ask that in Canada and in the United States. Yes, sometimes you get a funny answer. Uh, but young people from all over the world coming together in the hinterland of Nairobi to celebrate endeavor and success together through the achievement of their gold award, an uh, essential ingredient of which is an element not just of adventure, but voluntary service. And then from Nairobi on an European Union plane, because there are no commercial aircraft going into this area. It's an area called Somaliland, you may not have heard of Somaliland, you've probably heard of Somalia. Somaliland is, a, is an enclave. It's the size of France, so it's big. But it's an enclave within Somalia, but with its own coast. It used to be a British protectorate. It's an enclave which has managed to carve itself a place despite the constant attacks of Al-Qaeda-supported tribal bands, and that has managed to create a haven of peace and relative stability in the Horn of Africa, where there aren't any pirates, and when people are going about their daily business and who last year had a democratic contested election, where there was a change of government, who have a parliament, which is a functioning parliament. And I was there training and working with the parliamentarians. And yes, we have to have armed guards. Yes, there's a constant danger of another outrage, Al-Qaeda-inspired outrage, as there was three years ago, but there hasn't been one for three years. And they are building a democratic future. And then, from there, to Limerick in Ireland. How many of you here are Irish or of Irish origin? Well, Limerick's fine. <laughs> Limerick's fine. County Cork is fine. And I was there to meet with a global grouping of Rotarians who are just coming together to look at ways with their Irish counterparts. And uniquely for that institution, the Irish Rotarians have always stayed together north and south, even when the two countries in the island of Ireland separated. They stayed together, united by voluntary uh, activity. It was a good meeting, but you know it was a meeting that took place within the context of, I fear, a country that having come through internal sectarian conflict lasting for centuries, now has to confront its own economic demons of the collapse of property values, unacceptably high levels of 
of unemployment, pressures on the currency. Sound familiar? Sound familiar? We're interconnected. Because when I was in Phoenix, Arizona, that sounded familiar too. And so in the space of three weeks, you see the connections. That's the reality. That's where we are. 